So here's an interesting thing. How many times have you heard the accusation made? Of course, it was fundamental to the letter-writing campaign against Thunderfoot. How many times have you heard the accusation made that Thunderfoot is a Nazi or a Nazi sympathiser or a Holocaust denier? And how many times have you heard people scoff at that claim and deny that claim and say, what a ridiculous claim to make? I'm sure you've heard it a great deal of times. I'm so sure you've seen many videos where people have mentioned it or discussed it. But how many times, how many videos, how many discussions have you seen about the actual evidence? It seems it's kind of one of those really strange aspects of this whole situation is that people are happy to have an opinion of it and to discuss it and to, to make the accusation or deny the accusation. Many of whom have no knowledge of what this is actually about. The purported evidence that underpins it. Now I recall the exchange that this is based upon and it was an exchange, the second of two exchanges that Thunderfoot had with Ray Comfort and I recall watching it at the time and not drawing the conclusion at the time that Thunderfoot was a, a Nazi, a Nazi sympathiser or a Holocaust denier. But something I've been meaning to do for some time was to go back and revisit that conversation and I just keep putting it off for one reason or another. I've decided to put it off no more and to revisit that conversation so I started the process yesterday with a bid to, to deconstruct and to try and decide if the, there is any validity whatsoever to the claim that is being made. So I had a look at this, I watched the whole thing three times yesterday, made a series of notes and what I want to do now is to go through and make some conclusions based on what I saw. So what I will do is show you a series of clips from that exchange. Some of these clips are a little bit longer than I would like them to be, a couple of minutes long in one case. I apologise for that, but there's no point in me showing you a soundbite that doesn't represent uh, the bit of the conversation that you need to see. Now the first clip I'm going to show you is a little bit confusing. It's one of those clips where when you watch it, you kind of it doesn't seem to make any sense. Let me give you a little bit of perspective of what I think is going on here. And it will be demonstrated, actually, as this video goes on, that that is exactly what was taking place here. A lot of these, a lot of these conversations uh, that take place uh, with regards to theists and atheists, especially when it is on um, grounds of morality and ethics, they adopt the rule that you need to adopt in association football, in soccer, which is that the, the sort of mantra, try not to play the game on the edge of your 18-yard box. And what that kind of means is don't always play the game from that defensive position where you spend the entire game just defending uh, shots coming in on your own goal. Try and play the game in your opponent's half. Try and take the game to your opponent and play on his weak territory rather than on your weak territory and so it often goes with these discussions whether it's Ray Comfort or Thunderfoot or whether it's William Lane Craig debating Sam Harris or whatever is going on there is that what what tends to take place is this is that the Christian wants to portray morality as simple as possible wants to give you the most egregious sounding examples and the most obvious sounding examples because the answer they want is well it's obvious what the moral situation is there which implies moral objectivity which they claim therefore or implies some kind of deistic divine command uh, to either give that authority or so God-given sense of, of empathy or conscience that underpins our moral decision-making. That's the kind of point that they're trying to make. And you can play that game, but if you do that, you end up playing the entire game in your own half. The alternative is that you fire back with something that shows that actually morality is not as cut and dried as that, that we have these things that we regard as ethical dilemmas in which, in which one moral imperative runs afoul of another moral imperative, and it isn't entirely clear-cut which we choose, and so there is some subjectivity in terms of morality and just talking about a series of divine commands actually doesn't really make any sense. Even if such divine commands actually exist, it doesn't get us very far. Now, the reason I tell you this is because this first clip that I'm going to show you looks seriously, seriously confusing because Ray Comfort appears to ask Thunderfoot uh, a pretty simple question, really, a pretty direct question about Nazis. It would be about Nazis, wouldn't it? Because that's one of those little hot topics there, which if you give the wrong answer, it's going to look really, really bad. So he asks him this question about Nazis and about the murdering they did and whether that's right. 
And Thunderfoot's answer doesn't seem to bear any relation to the question. And the reason for that, and I watched this three times yesterday, is because his answer bears no relation to the question. He is attempting to do what I suggest. Rather than playing on the edge of his 18-yard box and bat back the question that suits Ray Comfort, he's effectively throwing it back to Ray Comfort and saying, well, actually... How about this moral dilemma? You see, morality isn't quite as clear-cut as the example that you're trying to give to me. That's what I think is going on here, and I, I'll show you why I think that when I show you the second clip. So let me give you that first clip, and then we'll take it from there. Well, let's stay with murder for a minute, because I want to talk about Nazi Germany. Uh, what Hitler did, he got 13 million. He was voted in for 13 million. Um, Oh, oh boy, doing an we're doing an interview, sir. I'm sorry. So if you could ask someone else, it'd be great. I don't know where the courts are. Thank you. Goodness me. We'll cut that bit out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll agree to cut that bit out. <laughs> no, I think it's pretty appropriate. He's asking where the courts are when we're talking about right and wrong and murder. So Hitler had 13 million votes. Um, what he did was legal in Germany. So was mass murder wrong in Germany? I mean, this is where it comes down to this very tough decision of what is beneficial for society and what is beneficial for the individuals. I mean, let me just say, for instance, what Hitler did couldn't have been enabled without um, science. It was the implementation of science in the form of technology that enabled him to do what he did. But, so, now, if I were to give you the choice of, say, for instance, let's include all of World War II as as the, the burden and the responsibility of science. So that's 50 million dead, 12 in the genocide. Um, and then you weigh that off against how many have been fed by science. I'm just going to give the, the Haber process, which produces the fertilizer that feeds about one in three people on the planet. So on one side, you've got the cost, which is it'll kill 50 million people. And on the other side, you've got the payoff, which it'll save 2 billion. So I think that this whole bit that Thunderfoot was giving you was a little bit confusing. I think Ray Comfort got a little bit confused there along the lines when he came to start responding to Thunderfoot in terms of confusing uh, the military usage of technology, which I think was what Thunderfoot was talking about, with the military development of technology. And I know that some people that have attempted to look at this clip have done the same thing. They've been looking at it in terms of military military processes, military action and warfare leading to technologies being developed and then those technologies having benefits, which is a question in itself and it's a legitimate moral dilemma at times in itself. But that wasn't what was being talked about here. Here we were talking about technologies that always exi already existed. The harbour process existed from back towards the First World War and we're talking about the Second World War. So we're talking about civilian usage to, to, to the betterment of all of us in this case for producing ammonia, for using ammonium, ammonium nitrate and urea in terms of fertilisers with using it as an explosive and its military uses there. So there is this kind of confusion there and there's also the confusion that has obviously taken place where people are looking at that answer he gave as if it was answering the question that Ray Comfort had asked. Of course if it was answering the question that Ray Comfort had asked it was neither it was neither a, a morally good answer or a morally bad answer. It would just be a load of gibberish because it doesn't address the question at all. It addresses a totally separate question. But Thunderfoot then goes on to clarify the question and I think this next clip clarifies what he's on about a lot better than the original run through. But this, this is this cuts to the nub of the moral question. How do you know what is right and what isn't? I know what's um, right and wrong because I've got moral absolutes. Okay, in which case, tell me which was the right decision. I give you the power to either save 50 million or save 2 billion. If you save the 2 billion, you're going to kill 50 million people. I can't follow your logic. Um, so if I give you the opportunity to not discover the science of, say for instance, in this case, nitrogen. It's the same science that creates the weapons that also feeds the people, right? If I give you the choice to, a moral choice now, if you decide to discover that science, it'll kill 50 million people, but it'll save two billion. And on the other side, um, you can choose to not discover it, you will save those 50 million, but two billion will starve to death. So I think it's quite clear when you watch that second clip that not only is he not sympathising with the Nazis or justifying 
the actions that took place during the Holocaust, what he's saying is, is that you could formulate a moral dilemma in which that's the negative side, that's the malevolent side of the dilemma. That is the moral evil, but then if you set that alongside a moral good, which is creating some technology that maybe leads in part to that terrible act, those terrible atrocities, but also leads to some moral goods that leads to billions of people being fed, then that provides one of those two horns of the dilemma. If that still isn't enough for you, even if when it's framed in those terms, you still say, well, even by putting it in those terms, suggesting that anything possibility could make you have to arrive at a situation where as if you had some kind of godly power, you would still allow those atrocities to take place. And so that makes him a Nazi sympathiser. Well, then I've also got to say that he's a communist sympathiser and not just a communist sympathiser, but a Stalinist sympathiser. Why? Because he went on to make another analogy, and this is the analogy that he made. Right, and what, what I'm doing here is I actually... There are two parts of your brain that cover um, interactions with others. There is the, the logistical side, which is the part that I'm engaging now. Right, this is very cold, you know... Um, and there are many examples like it. You know, the U.S. entry into World War II. You, America knew that Stalin was a butcher. They didn't know Hitler was at the time. They knew Stalin was a butcher, but they were happy to play along with Stalin because he was going to save American lives. He was going to promote Western ideas. Oh, well, he wasn't, but it, it would um, uh, sol um, solidify Western ideals, right? And for that, they were willing to play ball with a mass murderer of the level of Hitler. So applying the same logic here makes not only Thunderfoot a communist sympathiser as well as a Nazi sympathiser, and I'm not really sure how that works, but it makes the democracy-loving, communist, paranoid United States communist sympathisers as well. Or it could be that there's just a little bit more to this, and it's a very simplistic reading that you would only make if you either didn't understand the argument that he was making or you were deliberately setting out to misrepresent what he was trying to say. Um, of he does actually come back to the Nazi thing a little bit further on in the video and I'm going to play you a clip from that now because that's a really really interesting clip and it's perhaps another one of the clips that has led to this suggestion that Thunderfoot is a Nazi sympathizer so I'm going to play you that clip now it's about another 40 or 50 seconds let me see if I can get to your brain here it's 1933 you've got Adolf Hitler in your sights do you take him out you know that you're going to save 12 million again this is um the, uh, would I do it? Let me answer the question first. Um, I, I honestly don't know, because it's one of those things, those 12 million people, Why would you hesitate? You're going to save 12 million with one movement of your finger. Really? But if you didn't have that genocide, that genocide is um, instrumental in our history. If we didn't have those 12 million dead, would we have this... Would, we could have set the groundwork for an even bigger genocide. It was the lesson that we learned. You know, I kind of feel for him here because I think the question that he's been asked is a genuine um, kind of moral dilemma. It's the kind of dilemma that you often, that films have been made of, and films like, for example, Back to the Future, is this kind of dilemma of going back into the past and influencing the past is a recurring theme. And this is the problem with the questions such as it's phrased here, is it's not entirely clear what is being referred to, so it's not entirely clear how it should be tackled. And let me try and explain that to you. Imagine I said to you now that you walk out your front door and you see somebody about to murder somebody and you could stop them murdering that other person uh, without without any, any danger to yourself. I'm sure everybody would say, well, yeah, I, I would stop that murder happening. But I think we feel very different about things that happened in the past. So that if I said to you, I'm going to send you back to Victorian times. And when I send you back to Victorian times, you're going to see a murder about to be committed. Right. Are you going to intervene or not? Now, I think most people feel differently about that because they have knowledge of the present, of the present day now. And the fear is, is that if you influence the past, you really don't know what the knock on ramifications are going to be with the present. Now, we don't view the future, our future that is unknown to us in the same way as we view our present, if we imagine ourselves back in the past. So how, how you answer a question such as Ray Comfort gives here kind of depends how you're formulating the question in your mind. If you are imagining you going back into the past, knowing what you know now and knowing how things turn out, then you're going to answer that question differently than if you imagine yourself cut from fresh cloth being placed in that situation having no knowledge of the existence that you have left that you have 
uh, lived or of how things actually worked out that you've just you lived in that time uh, prior to Hitler taking power perhaps or per, per, prior to the, the world war starting you've got a chance to kill Hitler and the only the only nugget of information you're being told about the future is how many millions of people are going to die as a result of the war those are two very 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 different sets of circumstances personally knowing what I know now if you put me back in that position and said would I kill Hitler that's a huge decision to make and I don't think that I would make it I think I would do nothing because what I do know is is that the situation in Europe seemed to be coming to a head as a result of the First World War and the situation that Germany had been put into as a result of that war there were some simmering situations that were taking place perhaps if Hitler hadn't got to power nothing would have happened for 20 years or for 30 years and maybe then we would have had a world war and perhaps that would have been a, a thermonuclear war with a, a sure destruction on both sides and rather than tens of millions of people died maybe hundreds of millions of people died maybe vast tracts of northern and western Europe would be not just uninhabitable for a few years but uninhabitable for century after century now, that's a really big decision that you're putting. I know how things pan out, right? And I know that some terrible things happened, but I know that we're still kind of around now. Uh, and you want me to gamble all of that on this action when I have no idea of exactly how it's going to pan out. No, I'm not. I wouldn't be prepared to make that decision. And that doesn't make me a Nazi sympathizer. That just makes me somebody that isn't prepared to risk the fate of, 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 of Europe, of the entire continent and perhaps the entire world are on, on an action when I really don't know how that it's going to pan out, but I have some suspicions that it could pan out in a bad way just as it could pan out in a good way. Uh, and Thunderfoot kind of goes on without spelling it out like that. He kind of moves on to make the same point. So just the last clip of Thunderfoot here and then a few comments to sum up. Well, not really be a genocide in the Bible. Yeah, and if you ask people about genocide in the Bible, you know, no one really cares about it. I mean, uh, it, genocide wasn't a dirty word um, in the way that it is since we actually had mechanical genocide, you know, since we saw what would happen when you put the technology that mankind has available to it to the systematic extermination of people. I mean, all the time that it's people killing people, there's limits to the numbers that can actually happen. It was the technology that enabled to do it on a mechanical scale that really put this... Um, that really did show people what they were like, what they were capable of if the wrong people get into power. In other words, had the Second World War happened 20 or 30 years later than it did happen, then just perhaps none of us would be around to have the discussion now, and perhaps nobody would be around in lieu of us to have the discussion. So, I, I really can't formulate on the basis of any of this. This was kind of the last bit of the, the Nazi talk that took place in this conversation. I can't see how you can sensibly shoehorn in from any of that that Thunderfoot is a Nazi, a Nazi sympathiser or a Holocaust denier. That sounds an absolute load of hogwash as far as I am concerned. The rest of the discussion with, with Ray Comfort took place with regard to, to, to morality and regard. It, was, it got a little bit, uh, Thunderfoot got a little bit bogged down and on the back foot with regard to not wanting to play into Ray Comfort's hands and admit that that he could absolutely say that certain things were wrong which I think was a, 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 a tactical error on his part he could have tackled that better than he did but that's not the point of this video to go in terms of that what I would have liked to have done is for him to manage to achieve what he tried to achieve which was rather than to to spend the discussion on the back foot playing on the edge of his own 18 yard box to have pushed forwards and and actually managed to get Ray Comfort onto the edge of his 18 yard box what I would have liked to have seen him talk about he mentioned genocide in the bible then what i would have liked to have seen him do was to ask ray comfort about what the nazis did uh, in terms of the bible in terms of the way in which it's portrayed by the deuteronomist by the writer of what are often referred to as the deuteronomical history documents which portrays 
the acts of the Assyrians and the Babylonians against the Israelites, the abhorrent acts that they committed, very similar in many terms to what happened with the Jewish Holocaust, as just acts, as morally good acts. Why? Because these people, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, were being used by vehicles by God to punish his people. Part of being the chosen people, according to the Old Testament, is that you get certain privileges, but that you also are, are kept to this higher standard. And if you don't manage to keep to that standard, if you don't manage to keep Torah, if you don't manage to keep to the law, or if you start drifting off to other gods, you get punished. And God exacts his punishment, sometimes using foreign powers to punish you. So if that can happen then, if it was a just act when it was committed by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, then as far as a biblical perspective is concerned, that seems to be the best argument to suggest that what happened in the Holocaust was a morally just argument. So on what grounds could Ray Comfort say if he accepts what it says in the Bible and that the actions of the Assyrians against the Israelites was morally just, the Babylonians against the Israelites was morally just, well why couldn't the actions of of, of Nazi Germany against this Jewish population be morally just because perhaps they were being used by God in exactly the same way to punish the Jews. Now I find that morally repugnant of course but then I don't subscribe to the Bible and I don't subscribe to biblical morality. I would have liked to have seen that put to Ray Comfort and seen him play on the edge of his 18 yard box rather than the other way around. Well, if anybody else has anything to add to that or any other information that shows that Thunderfoot is a Nazi, maybe he's been uh, noted at a few rallies in Nuremberg or something like that over the years, then please let me know. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, thanks for watching and bye for now.